Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another TRU Talks. Um, I'm joined today by someone who's very well equipped to talk about the questions I'm going to ask, which is going to be about women's rugby, all the changes that have been going on there, especially pertaining to the World Cup that was due to take place this September. Um, I'm joined by Jessica Hayden, a freelance rugby union journalist who is a women's rugby columnist for Rugby Pass, a freelance rugby union journalist that has appeared on World Rugby, The Times, The Sunday Times, The Guardian and The Lions, as well as featuring on BBC Radio. Jessica, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. No, it's all right. Thank you very much for joining me because I know this was just literally a random message out of the blue. We've obviously interacted with each other quite a long time now, but actually in terms of having conversations or anything like that, because of the world we live in, um, there's been none, basically. And so that's kind of the way it's been. But obviously, thank you very much for joining me. Um, some, some juicy topics to get into. Yes. Yeah, it's been a big week for women's rugby. Oh, it certainly has. I think the last seven days. And then we will talk about some of the, the less savoury things that have been going on uh, in the world. But we'll we'll start off with what was probably one of the biggest news pieces of the week, in my opinion, certainly, which was the postponement of the 2021 Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. Um, obviously, this gives teams the better opportunities because we knew that some hadn't qualified. Is this the best decision, given the experience we're all going through in the world right now? Well, obviously, the World Rugby and New Zealand have to think about the COVID situation that's ongoing and no one seems to have any control over it apart from New Zealand. And I'm sure they want to hold on to that as best as possible. Um, so at the moment, it's a recommendation that will be considered by the Rugby World Cup Board and World Rugby Executive Committee uh, on the 8th and 9th of March, which I think is next Monday and Tuesday. I think it's the correct decision at the moment um, because a lot of teams haven't had the time needed that they need to prepare and um, there's a massive divide in women's rugby and um, as you know kind of between the professional and the amateur athletes and the vast majority are amateur and um, so they haven't really had the the chance to prepare there's also the key distinction between elite and non-elite teams and um, so if the government deems that women's rugby the national team is elite they get extra um extra rights in in COVID so they're allowed to travel whereas non-elite teams don't don't get that so there's there's also that divide that we need to be aware of it I think in terms of the preparation that teams would get as well it's really difficult um, to train at the moment with bubbles especially when most women have full-time jobs as well we a quarter of the teams haven't even qualified and we haven't really heard about what's what's happening there a lot of people are saying that the six nations women's six nations uh, would become the would double up as the World Cup qualifiers but we haven't really had much confirmation on that and as we were kind of edging closer and closer to September it just felt like it wasn't going to happen and um, there's also the issue of isolation um, which is really important at the moment in, in Covid times where you have to isolate you have to isolate for 14 days on arrival to New Zealand so for, for teams having to to spend 14 days before the the tournament um that's a huge blow especially because you have it's so strict you have to be in these kind of covid safe hotels uh that nick heath actually wrote for rugby pass he he said that that was three three thousand one hundred dollars per adult um or four thousand and fifty for two adults sharing a room which for a rugby world cup squad and their support staff would cost each union around fifty two thousand uh, pounds which is a lot of money, especially when unions don't particularly want to invest in the, in the women's game. Um, so there are loads of issues around how the tournament would happen. And that's, that's just getting out there. That's just kind of what happens between now and the start of the tournament. And then you have all the problems in the tournament of what if someone catches COVID, what do we do? Will New Zealand just say that's it? Because they've only had what maybe over, just over 2000 cases in the whole year or something I don't know that but like I think it's around there um so if they have one case they're going to put a lockdown on and that's going to be so damaging for the tournament especially because more people will be watching a women's rugby world cup than ever before um so yeah I think it's a really really good decision actually to to postpone it so it can be the best rugby world cup that it can be and this is this is maybe me put my business hat on a bit more for the, for this next question. But when we look at, you know, if, for example, the 2015 Rugby World Cup or even, you know, the, the Olympics in 2012, those were mainly done because of the massive financial benefits that it, they have. Obviously, they weren't too long after the financial crash and so on and so forth. And they have these amazing benefits in terms of 
you know, the tourism that it brings, because literally people flying from around the globe to see their teams, their nations compete at the very highest level. Do you feel that's part of it as well? Because we've seen recently in particular, there was that case, one case in Auckland that we've seen this week, and that's literally put the city in a lockdown. And actually that night, uh, England's women's cricketers were due to play New Zealand. And that was meant to have a full stadium, for example. This is, this is obviously very, this is a bit, you have to kind of relate it to the situation, but they were meant to have a full stadium. Then as soon as this one case comes through, the whole place is locked down, no fans, nothing like that's going on. Obviously, England did win that game. I should really point that one out as well. Uh, you know, Tammy Beaumont had and I having a wonderful start to it. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked now, thinking about other things that I like to do outside of rugby. Um, obviously, the loss of tourism as a result of COVID restrictions relating to travel, people are going to get put off by the fact they might have to pay like to put, stay in a hotel for a while, this, that and the other. Is that another big reason for this, do you feel? Absolutely. So I think at the moment, the the laws in New Zealand say that you can only travel there for work. So fans wouldn't have been able to travel to watch the, the Rugby World Cup. Anyway, um, I think if we wait a year and we have better control over the virus and hopefully back vaccinations that more fans can attend, Obviously, it's a huge deal for fans um, who want to attend. There are many, many fans who travel to all Rugby World Cups and want to go to this one. And New Zealand World Cup is fantastic, um, whether men's or women's. And it gives people the chance to travel around New Zealand as well. Um, and they can't do that at the moment because of COVID. If there is one case during the tournament, then of course, there we, we would expect for a massive lockdown. And maybe uh, as people based in the UK, because our government maybe aren't as quick to um, react to these things, we don't understand how strict New Zealand are with, with this. And it's completely correct to do so. I, I'm, I completely agree with New Zealand here. Um, but yeah, so I think that, hope, hopefully not to be too cynical, but, I agree with them that it would be better to have fans there and better to have um, a more exciting and um, engaging tournament for, for people to watch. And I think that requires fans being there. Oh, hugely. And I think we all want to see packed stadia again, whether, you know, because we have seen that in like Super Rugby games, for example, we've seen literally yeah. these packed stadiums. I spoke to a guy called Andy Ellis who played for the All Blacks in 2011 when they won the World Cup. And he was talking to me how he played in a charity cricket game and there was 10,000 people in the stadium to watch ex-rugby players, some current rugby players, I probably should point out as well, take on ex-cricketers. And that just blew my mind, to be honest, because I was thinking to myself, we can't even get two people in the park to watch a kickabout. But anyway, that's kind of beside the point <laughs> again. Um, this World Cup postponement comes literally weeks after we saw the, the Women's Six Nations competition be postponed. I think as we speak, that's probably... I'm going to say three weeks away now. Not far, is it? I mean, from this weekend. Yeah, it's, oh gosh, that is really close, isn't it? Yeah, it's coming up. I'm really excited for it. Oh no, so am I. I'm really looking forward to it as well. I'm looking forward to hopefully getting to a ground again. Uh, didn't do any of the men's games this year, so the women's games are definitely high on the list there as well. Um, and it's always good fun. I remember being at the Stoop just before lockdown last year. I was sat next, I think I was next, sat next to Sarah Orchard. And who, who was doing the BBC coverage of it? Was it Cat Merchant? I think it was. Oh, I can't remember. It was a long time. They were doing the show for, yeah. and they were like doing their like, they were doing like all their show notes for later on and stuff like that. And it was a wonderful day. I think there was, I'm going to say 10,000 people in the stoop that day. And it was, it was brilliant to see that many people celebrating women's rugby in such a way. But anyway, um, that's not that far away now, but the premier kind of women's competition in the Northern Hemisphere, it was postponed because of the travel, because of France, this, that, and the other. And we can make comparisons to the men's team and say, well, they went for waffles in Rome, but that's kind of a bit of an aside. Um, was the as a result of that do you think it was expected because the travel you know travel from england to france is a bit frowned upon the travel from england a few thousand further miles down the road to new zealand that's that's a bit more significant yeah i guess it was a warning um that maybe the women's world cup wouldn't go ahead um obviously being such a big tournament but also with being so close together um, and a lot of the countries, although, you know, Wales, Scotland, um, they differ from England, we are close, we're, we're, we're one island. So I kind of thought, well, if, if this even can't go ahead, and I know it was more France um, and Ireland that, and, that were uh, issues with the postponement, um, if that can't go ahead, then how could the Rugby World Cup go ahead? So that was the first kind of 
big warning, you know, as soon as they, they just kept missing, the Six Nations kept missing the deadline to tell us what was happening, I just thought, yeah, this is going to be postponed and that probably means the Rugby World Cup will be postponed, which is such a shame because we did see this Women's Six Nations as a um, brilliant precursor and uh, like appetizer for the Rugby World Cup. So it's a shame, but I think still it's standing on its own two feet, the new side of the tournament will be a really great advert for women's rugby regardless. Um, but yeah, it also, I think, kind of exposed um, a, an inequality or a lack of fairness in the women's game in, with it, within the tournament between teams, because obviously we have professional versus amateur, we have elite versus non-elite, um, and that's really unfair. But it also, I think, showed the, the more, this is me putting my kind of political hat on here, um, but the kind of the systematic inequalities where we're really pushing the men and the men's doesn't get postponed. Obviously, we know that there have been issues with the men's tournament and there are issues with the Autumn Nations Cup as well. But, but that could go ahead because of the funding, the sponsorship, the broadcast deals, the support that they, they get as players, the ability to bubble because they're all professional athletes who can do that and can afford to do that. Uh, and they aren't athletes who also work as doctors and nurses and teachers and loads of other jobs that are equally valid and um, important so I think that was really that really shows and I think as well uh, there's a really good piece in the Telegraph um, from Fiona Thomas about you know we're really pushing the Lions tour to go ahead obviously men's Lions tour to go ahead when the women are having all their tournaments cancelled and that's not to say that it isn't the right decision or it isn't fair um, but at the moment, I think it, that's just kind of exposed to fans. Well, this is why it's so unfair. This is why the difference is so huge, because you have men who are professional athletes and you have women who are still amateur. And that makes putting these competitions on so difficult. Yeah, I just completely agree. I mean, I remember seeing some BBC reports. They were talking about you know, players have been doctors and, and working in hospitals during the pandemic and all this, that and the other. But I, I suppose the reward of being pushed away from the men's competition is that the women's game is going to get its own spotlight and I think it's been something we've talked about for years literally you know trying to get the women's game or the women's calendar I suppose is a better way of putting it pushed away from the men's especially with the six nations when we've seen literally kind of you know I'm going to use the phrase because it's probably the right way of putting it literally women's game shoehorned in after the men's games for example at Twickenham and and I think it's happened at other other big stadia as well when after the men have played the women have played and that's kind of been that but I've obviously seen personally. I've, I feel like I've seen a mentality change when the women played the the barbarians prior to the yeah. men, and that got loads of people down. I was there that day, sat next to Serge Betson. Really weird story that is. But um, he, everyone was speaking French around him as well. I didn't know what I was. I was apparently I was in the French section. But um, <laughs> is is that a really good thing because it gets its own spotlight now, away from the men's game and away from that kind of. I suppose it because it, it feels like on the day it, it was never really a thing that was talked about. Absolutely. But before I talk about that, I just want to point out that that Barbarians game, uh, I went there as a fan, not as a journalist. I went there um, with my dad and um, I tried to get in before for the women's game and they kept telling me, oh, no, kickoff isn't, in isn't for two hours. You can't get in. I was like, no, that's the men's game. The women are playing right now. And the security guards out the front didn't actually know that the women were playing. And so I missed kickoff by about 20 minutes. And finally, by the time I found someone in a suit who was wearing um, a Twickenham badge, I just said to them, look, I'm here for the women's game. I can't get in. I've paid for this. I can't get in. And they let me in and they, with my dad, and we got to the top stand and we were the only people in the entire stand because nobody could get in. And that just, I mean, that was a couple of years ago now, but that just shows how, um, how terrible it is sometimes uh, for, for women's rugby fans to even want to watch women's rugby. But yeah, sorry, I just needed to say that because that was <laughs> a good example of how unfair it is. Um, for the Women's Six Nations, yes, it's a really good one-off tournament. Uh, it's a, a new structure that kind of mirrors how the Autumn Nations Cup was. Some people love the Autumn Nations Cup, some people hate it, so it might be a little bit contentious. Um, I guess it, it could have been a lot better than it was, um, but hey-ho. I think it, this tournament serves as a really good one-off because there are two fewer games for each team. And when you have unions that are developing their women's side, the, the more games they have, the better. The more chance they have to play together, the better. So 
I would be really keen to see more women, um, more women's rugby games in the calendar because uh, it helps those those unions develop. Um, but overall, I'm happy. I can't complain too much. I think it's really good that it's standing on its own two feet. As you said, it's away from the men's game. It's not in the shadow, um, which is fantastic for, for more people to be able to watch. I think the, the key issues at the minute are finding a broadcaster to show it and a title sponsor. So the, the Six Nations actually hired a consultant to try and find a broadcast a, a sponsorship a title sponsor for the tournament um, and there is broadcast interest as well so I think we we are really getting close to a really good tournament it's just if that happens we're you know as you say we're maybe three weeks away less than a month away and we still haven't got that confirmation um, so it'd be great to get that soon and the longer it goes without that confirmation the more I worry that this won't happen um, but it could be a really good advert for women's rugby. I think the important thing for the broadcaster to do is make sure that the kickoffs don't overlap because I'm fed up with Premier 15s of having to have three screens to be able to watch women's rugby. Um, but also for the Six Nations, it's happened before where you, you can watch England on the telly maybe, but if you want to watch Wales, you have to get S or C on your on Facebook and watch that on your phone, but the kickoff still overlaps, so you have to watch both games at the same time. So I think it's really important that all the games are scheduled correctly so that we can watch all the games that we want to watch, because um, it's so important that England fans and young girls who play rugby in England are also watching Scotland and Wales and Ireland and all the other nations play as well so that they can get behind those teams um, like football fans do you know they they do that even men's rugby fans do that they watch all teams so yeah it's really important for me that we get this uh, broadcast yeah no it most certainly is um, and then I mean, the next couple of things we're going to talk about, they're slightly interlinked. Obviously, after the, the women's competition was postponed for, I mean, I can't remember what it was. It was like two months or something like that. I can't really remember off the top of my head. Everything feels like it was an age ago at this stage in life, to be honest. But um, mm. there was, there's been plenty of attention paid to women's sport. I mean, I think I referenced the I Care movement as well, as well some of the work that some of the work that Girls Rugby Club is doing at present uh, with their kind of movements and their, they're trying to educate people about women's sport in particular how important are those those people because the thing is at the end of the day women's sport is still unfortunately a new concept to a lot of people absolutely you know what I'm actually sitting next to my eye care leaflet that Steph Evans sent me to read about eye care <laughs> yeah it's fantastic um so the eye care movement and girls rugby club are both really really good examples of what women's rugby players are doing to to showcase the sport so I Care was launched by Steph Evans, who's a Bristol Bears player. Um, and it's a it's a fantastic campaign just to show we, that people care. And it was started in response to people commenting on Sky Sports uh, saying, oh, I, I don't care about women's rugby. Who cares about women's rugby? And Steph would say, well, I care. And then loads of other people saying, yeah, I care too. And that was the, the birth of the hashtag. Um, and Rachel Burford with Girls Rugby Club, again, is another example of a player who is going above and beyond to really showcase women's rugby. And what unites Steph and Rachel is that they are both not only trying to provide better clothes and kit and stash for women's rugby players, but both are actually really trying to educate us as well, and educate girls. So that's on and off the pitch. So Rachel Burford um, doesn't just run training camps and coach girls and women to play rugby she also runs educational sessions and webinars so I believe last week she had one on um, periods and menstruation and playing rugby and managing that um, and then you know she backs it up with selling um, period pants and shorts so that women and girls can play rugby and feel more confident when they are on their period Steph similarly has a resource section on her website and she's constantly trying to teach people about women's rugby on Ruggette RFC. Um, but also, you know, I think what's so amazing about Steph is she has a background in retail manufacturing. So she, she went along to loads of women's rugby games and measured the thighs, the hips, the bums of women's rugby players and created shorts that were specifically for women's rugby players because I play rugby and most of the time I have to wear men's shorts 
that just don't fit me at all. They are so uncomfortable. They ride up. They just, they're made for a male physique, not a women's physique. And we're so different. We hold our fat and our muscle differently. Um, so it's really important that players are, are doing these things and, and where maybe sponsors and brands are failing to do this the players are saying, actually, this isn't good enough. Like we need kit, we need support, we need this education that we're not getting. Um, and Rachel Burford, again, she, she's, she's just run this like concussion survey because who else is doing it? Who is doing that survey? Who is finding out about concussion in women's rugby? Nearly nobody. There are a few really good researchers, but from the unions, I mean, we're not hearing much. Um, whereas Rachel ran a survey through all the girls rugby club members to find out about concussion and how they're responding to it. And then from that is launching a, she, so she had a blog about concussion. Um, and uh, I think there's a webinar coming up with a concussion expert about concussion in women's rugby, because it's so different to concussion in men's rugby. Um, so yeah, I think it's really, really important. I'm sorry I went on a, a tangent there. It's something I'm really passionate about because these players are just being fantastic for the game, I think, and they're real trailblazers, I think, in, in pushing the women's game forward. No, completely agree. And there will be links to Rugget and Girls Rugby Club somewhere on the article if you're, if you're watching it on the webpage or in the description of the YouTube uh, as well as links to Jess's stuff, which is obviously inherent with this kind of an interview, but, you know, it feel wor feels worth saying it anyway. Um, now, obviously, we're talking about really positive things and, and, you know, putting efforts into a positive thing. Let's talk about people that have been putting their efforts into quite negative and, frankly, horrible things. Um, now, to mention, obviously, this is about women working in sport, not women in sport, because they are slightly different, apparently. This is what I learned when I was writing these things down the other night. But um, we saw a lot of abuse directed at the BBC, Sonia McLaughlin, at the weekend following the England-Wales game. Uh, I think to do with her interview with Owen Farrell, obviously... Now I'm going to shock people. I, I kind of turn the telly off after after the games usually finish anyway. I don't often watch the post-match analysis. So when I saw it on Twitter later on, I was watching it. It felt to me it was a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because if mm -hmm. she didn't ask the questions, it would have been the same thing. Now, personally, as someone who's watched plenty of sport as the years have gone by, I think probably watched a lot of terrible sport as well. That's never been something I would have ever said that's been directed at male commentators, male pundits, male interviewers. Do you feel like it's, it's things like that that discourage young women from wanting to work in sports and sports media? That's a really good question. Um, of course, there will be young girls and young women um, or any, anyone really who, who has seen that Twitter abuse recently, because it's not just Sonia, um, Nolly Waterman, um, Maggie Alfonsi, Jill Douglas, loads of women have received this abuse, even like Gabby Logan as well, she, she had it as well. Um, this abuse on, online and it's terrible and it, it really, it's disheartening. And sometimes when these things happen, it, it makes you think, well, it, maybe this isn't the, the, a safe a safe space as I thought it was. Maybe this isn't as respectful as I, as I thought it was. Um, and it's, that's really difficult and it is hard. And I think a lot of women who I spoke to in the last week who work in the same industry as us um, were, were kind of upset by it and shaken by it. Um, it's not to say that this doesn't happen to men ever because Gareth Thomas got some horrific homosexual, homophobic abuse um, it, in, when he was co uh, commentating or in the studio for the rugby as well. Um, it's horrific and abuse doesn't have a place in any game or in anywhere in life. It's just pathetic. I think as a fan, if you're watching as a, as a fan, the best thing I think fans can do is ignore it because I always say, if you share it, more people see it. And you wouldn't, if there was a fire, you wouldn't pick up the fire and carry it into another room and say, hey, look at this fire. Cause <laughs> that just spreads the fire. You wouldn't yeah. do that. Um, so don't don't do it. Don't add fuel to it. If you if you kind of share it and say what an idiot, then that's just all your followers seeing that. And if a few of them agree with what that person says and then retweet it or comment on it and agree with them, then it just spirals out of control. And that's kind of what happened, unfortunately, last weekend with Sonia. Um, that being said, 
for the victims of the abuse, they should not ignore this and they should not be told, oh, just, just forget about it, don't focus on it, because that's a, that's ridiculous advice. It's impossible. And like, you know, if someone criticizes your work, even if you have like 10 people saying, oh, that was a great piece, the one person that says, I didn't enjoy that, that's the only thing that you think about, which is because we want to be better, right? But that's all you focus on. So the players cannot just ignore this or the, the commentators, the pundits, whoever, they cannot ignore it. Um, they need to report it. I think Twitter needs to do more to make sure that this social media abuse is controlled, that we don't have all these anonymous accounts because they are terrible. Um, people need to be held responsible for what they say and how they make people feel. Um, the, the other thing that I want to address is that we absolutely can and should criticize people who are poor in knowledge, men and women. And Rachel Burford wrote a fantastic column on this for Rugby Pass about um, the co-commentary in the Premier 15s. We absolutely should call out people or maybe not call them out, but we should, we should comment on it when knowledge isn't good enough or when interviews aren't good enough. But that's not what happened this weekend because I thought Sonia asked the correct questions and a lot of people think that it, she was too aggressive, but actually you need to get a reaction. And it's not the question that matters, it's the answer. And I think that a lot of the, the questions sometimes do have to be, and you know this, like, but for people watching, like those questions are sometimes things you really don't want to ask, but you have to, because it's what people are interested in. It's what your readers or your watchers are gonna be interested in. Um, so I think she asked the right questions and she's a professional and she's been doing this for so long, she knows far better than me or anyone really, like she's she's like a, a generation or two above us, right? And she's been doing this for a lot longer and is fantastic at what she does. Um, so yeah, I just think it has no place in the game. It has no place anywhere. No one should receive this abuse. And if anyone is put off by it, then that would be a travesty because I think Sonia, is a fantastic example of what women can achieve in rugby journalism, rugby broadcasting. Um, she's really risen the ranks through, t uh, through talent and determination and not because she's a woman, because she's one of the best in the business. So yeah, let, I don't think anyone should be put off by it, but I think we need to do a lot more to control this kind of abuse. Oh, 100% agree. It was, it was saddening seeing Sonia's tweet in particular. I think that was the one that kind of hit home with me because you can only see so much of it and you know and, and the thing is what I, what I took away from it and obviously obviously I, I've got to the end of my list of questions now but this is kind of just more of an aside thing but when I was watching the pre-game stuff Sonny did an interview with Owen then and he was very much the same kind of personality that's just maybe their relationship and this is what you know it's a pain it's a pain that this is the way that things are viewed um, and everyone's been made a lot more cynical in the last year I'd say as well personally um, yeah yeah definitely I think we only see the five minutes of that interview, the pre-recorded one that should before, um, you know, where she was really challenging going on, okay, well, what, what hasn't gone well? Some people have said it was rubbish. What do you think? Um, but that might just be the banter that they have and the relationship that they have, you're right. Because, you know, like when you go to interview a player, you might be chatting and having a bit of banter and getting on for five, 10 minutes before you even hit the record button. Um, but you know what, that opened up a really good discussion and it was a really good um, precursor to the game because we could see what the captain was thinking. And that's a really important thing. And even if it looked like he was disagreeing with everything Sonia said, Sonia knew exactly what he was going to say. I don't think that she would have been very surprised by it because it still went out and she was happy with it beforehand. Um, so, yeah, I think that's just how, how these things go. And it's just the... The way that journalism works and I've seen a lot of journalism experts kind of pop up the, in the last few days saying um you know this isn't journalism this isn't this isn't what people want to watch and I'm thinking well I'm sorry but it is it is what people want to watch it's it's really important questions to ask um and she doesn't need anyone to tell her what real journalism is because she is an expert in rugby journalism and she wouldn't be as successful as she is if she didn't know that so yeah <laughs> run over no, it's completely, no, obviously, I think everyone's got the thoughts about it. I did a piece, I do um, this thing called Six Nations and Six, which just goes out like once a week. I'm talking about it 
And I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, I overran with the whole social media thing at the weekend because at the end of the day, I was just there like, I need to get my words out correctly. And I kind of just overran with it and you have to say what you're thinking. And, and it's even the stuff that was directed at Alice Genj later on that evening or whatever, yeah. or the next day or whatever the hell it was. But yeah, um, we're gonna have Anytime. to- <laughs> oh, another thing is, Alice Genj just literally said, I'll, I'll offer you out. And then I think that's when everyone goes, yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, let's stop. Let's, let's maybe stop this. He's a, he's a big Bristolian. Um, yeah. But no, Jessica, th those are the questions I had. That was the TRU talks. Well, I mean, firstly, was that all okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having me. That was really interesting. No, um, and for people who don't know you and might want to follow you after this TRU talk, uh, where can people find you? So I'm on Twitter at underscore Jess Hayden, which is H-A-Y-D-E-N. Um, and I'm the women's rugby columnist at Rugby Pass. So I, I yeah, I post my ramblings and my rants there most of the time. <laughs> and, and please do give that, that that column a read. It is honestly, I will, I, I don't often go out of my way to read rugby content because I kind of have to internalise a lot of things. But your columns are one, one, are one of the few exceptions that I will literally just read every week because oh, thank you. no honestly it's, it's a really enjoyable read to anyone that's watching listening I don't know how people usually watch or consume this content but um honestly it's really enjoyable please go and read it um but yeah I've been Joe Harvey uh, you can find me all over Talking Rugby Union's website to be honest some might say too much um but yeah thank you very much for watching this and I'm sure uh, you'll see me next time